are you saying? The cat frowned. This thing feeds off emotions. Crichton nodded. Exactly. It changes shape to provoke a negative emotion. In this case, fear. It took Mister Lister to the very limit of his terror, then sucked out his fear. Then what happened? It vanished. It turned into a cloud of steam and floated out of the room. The cat looked down at Lister's inert form on the medical unit's biofeedback couch. Is he okay? Apparently so. It's just he no longer has any sense of fear. Rimmer stopped pacing. The question is, what are we going to do? Lister's eyes flicked open, and he lurched upright on the couch. Well, I say, let's get out there and twatter. Lister, you're ill. Rimmer started pacing again. Just leave this to us. Lister smacked his fist into his palm. I could have had it in the sleeping quarters, only it took me by surprise. Lister, it turned into an eight feet tall armor-plated killing machine. I've had bigger than him. They're all the same. These armor-plated killing machines. One good fist in the gob, they soon lose interest. It's probably best you stay calm, sir," said Crichton soothingly. "You've lost all sense of fear. You're not thinking rationally. What's there to be scared of? If it wants a Barney, we'll give it one. One swift knee in the happy sack, it'll drop like anyone else. Fine," Rimmer nodded. "Well, we'll certainly bear that in mind when we're constructing our strategy. I'll rip out its windpipe and whip it to death with a tonsil end." "Yes, very good." Rimmer caught Crichton's eye and nodded discreetly in the direction of the sedative cabinet. "I'll shove my fist so far down its gob, I'll be able to pull the label off its underpants." Crichton pushed the syringe into Lister's arm. Lister looked down at the hypodermic. What's that, pal? You start in trouble. I'm sorry, Mister Lister, sir. It's just a little something to relax you. Come on, then, slags. Lister lunged at him drunkenly. I'll have you all, one at a time, or all together. Makes no odds to me. I'll, I'll. Lister smiled as the sedative flushed into his bloodstream and fell back onto the couch. Rimmer sighed. Thank God for that. All right. As far as I can see, we've got two alternatives. One, we take this thing on and we don't rest until it's dead. Or two, we run away. He hardly paused. Who's for two? Sounds good to me," voted Crichton. "Always been my lucky number," agreed the cat. Rimmer's plan was cowardly but simple. They would go up to the supply deck, grab whatever they could fit into a supply wagon, load it onto Blue Midget, the one remaining shuttlecraft. And get the hell out. Without emotions to feed on, the polymorph would eventually die. In the meantime, they could survive on Garbage World for as long as necessary. What about him? The cat nodded at the snoring Lister. He'll only slow us down. We'll pick him up when we've got the supplies. They sealed the sedated Lister in the medical unit and started making their way up to the supply deck. The mesh cage of the service lift juddered noisily to a stop. Three feet above the floor of the supply deck, the cat's boot democratically elected that Crichton should be first out. He went next, followed by Rimmer. Before them stretched the endless ranks of cargo crates, a huge regular matrix that covered almost twenty acres. The cat adjusted the strap of his backpack that powered the enormous bazookoid mining laser. Let's get this over with. This damn gun's destroying the line of my suit. Crichton trundled in the lead, nervously swinging his bazookoid at every imaginary sound. He'd never worn a grenade belt before, and he wasn't exactly in love with the way the grenades clanked noisily against his metal chest plate with each movement. They turned left at the first intersection, and there, empty in the aisle, was a gleaming yellow supply truck. It looked brand new. Crichton unbuckled his grenade belt, set it down beside his mining laser and backpack. And started loading up the truck. The cat's eyes scoured the gloom, but caught no movement. Rimmer stood jiggling his right leg nervously and occasionally clapping his hands to hurry Crichton along. Twenty minutes later, the truck was full. Let's go! Rimmer hissed, and Crichton and the cat climbed up into the cab. Then something made Rimmer stop. Something about that truck, too yellow. Too new, 
too convenient. He started backing away. Come on, buddy, let's move it. Let's go, go, go. Fair, pull him off. Rimmer's voice was barely audible. It's. The cat swung out his mining laser. Where? It's. Rimmer could hardly speak with fear. Say it, dog breath. Where is it? It's the truck. The polymorph is the supply truck. Crichton somersaulted backwards out of the cab and rolled down an aisle. The cat's buttocks clenched so tightly they became a single ball before he unfroze and launched himself after Crichton. As the cat landed by his side, Crichton ripped a thermal grenade from his belt, twisted the detonator handle, and bowled it under the cab. The explosion flung the truck fully thirty feet in the air, and the blast debris rained down on top of them: tires, engine parts, burnt-out chassis, and broken windscreen glass. The cat stood up and strode over the smouldering debris to the recess in the aisle where Rimmer was cowering. That supply truck. He jabbed at Rimmer with the barrel of his bazookoid. The one we just spent twenty minutes loading with supplies. Wise, get this. A supply truck. Rimmer smiled contritely. Yes, he agreed. I can see that now. Twenty minutes we spent loading that thing, and now we gotta start all over. There. Rimmer cut across him. In the shadows. He pointed past Crichton down the aisle. Something moved. I think he's ra 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 ra. Crichton whopped his head on the corner of a crate. I think he's right. The blast must have drawn it. Set the bazookoids to heat seeker. If there's anything out there, the laser bolts will find it. Crichton and the cat snapped the bazookoid control setting over to heat seeker, braced themselves for the recoil, and fired. Two blue balls screamed down the length of the aisle and vanished into the distant murk. They waited for the explosion, listening to the fading howl as the bolts sped harmlessly down towards the far end of the supply deck. But the explosion didn't happen. There was nothing there. Rimmer felt the cat's look. Sorry, he held up his hands apologetically. My fault. False alarm. The laser bolts reached the end of the supply deck, flipped over like two Olympic swimmers, and began powering back through the traces of their own tails. The cat was still berating Rimmer when, for the third time in as many minutes, Rimmer pointed past him and said in the same fear-stricken voice, "There, what now?" The cat snapped. "You got a bad case of the jitters, buddy." Rimmer shook his head. The cat sighed, turned, and saw the bolt speeding back towards them. "I don't understand it," Rimmer said. "Holograms don't produce heat. Neither do mechanoids." What are they homing in on? Rimmer and Crichton turned and looked at the cat. The cat said three words. The three words were, "So long, guys." He hoisted his bazookoid onto his shoulder and he started to run. The cat knew he could move, even with the weight of the backpack and the bazookoid, even with the rather impractical tight silver trousers and the two-inch Cuban heels. He would still have put money on himself to outrun just about anything. But the question was this: Could he outrun two heat-seeking laser bolts? The honest truth was, he didn't know. He had no idea whether it was even possible to shake off two spinning bolts of death, whose entire existence was dedicated to finding something that emitted heat and blowing it up. Still, he thought it would be a good idea to try, so he did. His neck craned back, and his knees pistoned up and down, pumping so high they beat his chest with every step. He heard the bolt's distinctive "zazoom" as they rounded the corner and ripped down the aisle in pursuit. At the next intersection, he zigged left and zagged right. The sound of the bolts faded slightly. He could corner faster than they could. Hey, things were looking up. Sure, they were faster than him on a straight. But if he kept turning, if he found enough corners, he could outrun these suckers until their power ran down. He was feeling good now. This wasn't going to be nearly as difficult as he expected. He came up to a maze of intersections, twisted left, right, and left again. Behind him, he heard the bolts overshoot a turn, and their low humming throb dimmed in volume. He'd bought himself a couple of seconds—seconds seconds he badly needed. 
He pulled out a mirror and checked his hair. It was still perfect. He pulled out a small metal cylinder, freshened his breath, and took off again. Another right, another left, another right, and suddenly he was in a straight. A long, narrow corridor lined with cargo crates. Three hundred yards without a turning in sight and no exit. Just a door at the very end of the corridor marked Lift. The bolts rounded the bend behind him. The confident grin dribbled off his face. Then the cat did the most stupid thing possible. He stopped. He planted both feet firmly on the grilled metal deck and waited for the lasers to hit him. Half a second before they did, he climbed into the air. He kicked his legs above his head and backflipped his feline form over the sizzling bolts. He watched them as they soared down the aisle before they corrected their course and curved back towards him. He started to run. He started to run straight at them. Two feet from impact, he launched himself upwards again and Fosbury flopped over the deadly blue missiles. Again, they roared by underneath him and prepared to turn. He glanced down the aisle and started towards the lift. The metal on his Cuban heels spat sparks as he skidded up to the lift and slapped the lift call button and waited. Nothing happened. He slapped it again. The laser bolts streaked towards him. He slapped it a third time, and the doors opened, but too late. He felt the bolts heat on his face and ducked, simultaneously slapping the door close button. The doors hammered shut and trapped them. The cat peered in through the observation window and watched the bolts helplessly swirling around inside. He pulled a tiny silver toothbrush out of his jacket pocket and started to groom his eyebrows. You either got it, or you ain't. And you little blue guys, you ain't even close. He smelt the girl's perfume as she leaned over his shoulder. To the cat's mind, she was the second most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen: long black hair. Short orange PVC suit, thigh-length boots, and a whip. It was hard to stop his eyes from watering. Clearly, this girl had class. She spoke. What are you looking for? A mutant, the cat said casually. It's、uh, dangerous. His eyes half closed and his eyebrows smouldered above them. Can turn into anything. Sounds pretty scary. A bravado snort jetted down the cat's nostrils. Must take a pretty brave kind of guy to do this kind of work. You think? And smart. Bet you have to be smart too. Definitely. You got to have your wits about you all the time. Don't let up for one second, or it'll sneak up behind you and blip your dog meat. They reached an intersection. The cat held up his hand and leant out. When he was satisfied, it was safe. He beckoned her forward with a nod of his head. Come on, baby. Did anyone ever tell you you're quite a guy? The cat shrugged. Not since this morning. Smart, brave, handsome. She ran her hand sensually down the curve of her hip. In fact, I think you're probably the best-looking guy I've ever seen. Well, he laughed modestly. I didn't want to be the first to say it. You know what I'd really like. She tormented the button on his jacket with a long-nailed finger. I'd really like to make love to a guy like you. The cat lost a short, one-sided struggle with a large, cheesy grin. Well, I'm sure I have a window in my schedule somewhere. He raised his wrist and looked at a watch that wasn't there. What are you doing in say ten seconds time? Nothing. I couldn't cancel. The cat leant into her. Hi, I'm the cat. Hi, she leant back. I'm the genetic mutant. Glad to know you. The cat leered. Jenny, who? There was a revolting ripping of flesh, and the girl's head folded in on itself. From the mess of pink blubber, a feeding tentacle snaked out and hit the cat between the eyes. The polymorph suckled noisily as it feasted on the cat's vanity. Crichton heard the cat scream and doubled his pace. At top speed, he could waddle at nearly twenty-five miles an hour, and he soon lost Rimmer in the maze of crates. 
he came across the cat lying groaning, barely conscious. Crichton set down his bazookoid and cradled the cat's head in his hand. My goodness, are you all right? The cat moaned and blinked open his eyes. Don't worry about me, bud. I'm nobody. Rimmer appeared around the corner. Is he dead? Who cares? said the cat. The mechanoid shook his head. I think he's lost his vanity. Rimmer's eyes spat hate at Crichton. You've done it again, haven't you? Done what, sir? Crichton's plastoid brow crinkled into a frown. Failed. First, the Nova Five. Whose fault was it the ship crashed? Whose fault was it the crew died? But that was... Crichton stammered. I didn't... I was only trying to... And who brought the polymorph aboard Red Dwarf in the first place? Yes, but I didn't know. I... Crichton's mouth yacked open and closed, but no sound came out. First Lister, now the cat. You won't be happy till everyone's dead, will you? Oh! Crichton's voice cracked. Please! Please what? We were supposed to stick together. You let the cat run off alone. But that wasn't... He stuttered. I mean... He trusted you. Now look at him. Crichton covered his face with his hands. Oh, goodness! I feel so... so... guilty! Rimmer smiled. Then his head collapsed in on itself, and a green sucker ripped out from the slime and fastened onto Crichton's skull. The real Rimmer skidded round the corner as the polymorph finished feeding on the mechanoid's electronic emotion and evaporated into a cloud of steam. What's going on? What happened? Crichton turned to face him. The polymorph. It turned into you, then sucked away my guilt. I have lost the single emotion that prevents my transgressing the mores and manners of civilized society. Come on, let's forget the supplies. We'll go back for Lister and just get the hell out of here. Screw Lister, said Crichton, flicking out a middle finger and jabbing it in the air. And quite frankly, Rimmer, screw you. Halfway back to the medical unit, something happened to Rimmer. They were speeding along one of the series of mile-long moving walkways, the cat slugging from a bottle of cheap Tunisian whiskey he'd smashed out of one of the dispensing machines, and Crichton was taking laser pot shots at the advert boards that sped by when Rimmer staggered and clutched his stomach. Crichton shot out the mouth of a man advertising toothpaste and turned, sniggering to see Rimmer totter to his knees. What's the matter with you, groin breath? It's inside me, Rimmer gasped. The polymorph. No, is that all? Crichton tutted and went back to his target practice. The cat blew his nose into his tie and belched twice. <laughs> uh, uh. How is that possible? It's not here. Crichton blasted the kooky cola bear out of existence. It's broken into the hologram simulation suite, turned itself into electronic data, and infiltrated his personality disk. Anyone whose brain wasn't constructed from discarded sphincter could work that one out. You're right, said the cat. I'm a moron. I'm a nobody. I'm not fit to be alive. Agreed, Crichton nodded and trained the barrel of his bazookoid on the cat. Kiss your ass goodbye, cat he said, and fired. There was a disappointing click, and the charge meter flashed empty. Damn, said Crichton. Oh, I hear, said the cat. I was really looking forward to being dead. I don't deserve any better. Don't worry, I'll kill you later when I get a new gun. Well, the cat smiled gratefully. Only if it's convenient. It's not worth putting yourself out for a useless piece of shit like me. Rimmer lay writhing on the floor as the polymorph wriggled through his data bank, searching through his personality disk, trying to stimulate a new emotion to sample. Images jolted into Rimmer's brain, memories half forgotten.
A hot summer day, waiting outside a cinema for a girl who doesn't turn up. Three hours he's waited, three hours. Boy, that makes him... Putting together a cheap self-assembly study desk with four missing screws. Hammering his thumb with a wooden mallet. Smegging mallet. A baby now, five months old. He's dropped his teething ring and no one picks it up. Can't they hear him screaming? Don't they know how badly he needs that teething ring? God, they really make you... Twenty-four, and in the Space Corps. He's coming home on a weekend furlough, and he's stuck in a traffic jam for six hours. Six precious hours are totally wasted, and all the time he's getting more and more... Now ten. He wants to go to the Russian circus. Not much to ask. It's making a once-in-a-lifetime visit to his hometown. Everyone in his class has been, and then his parents say he can't go because he didn't mow their lawn, because he didn't mow their lousy, smegging lawn. Not fair. That really makes you... He's thirty. He's opening a letter. Failed to meet the required standard. But he's worked harder than anyone. It makes him feel so damn... Seventeen. And for the first time in his life, he brings a girl home to meet the family. Sunday afternoon, he chances into the greenhouse, and there she is, behind the tomato plants with his brother, John. Would you believe it? Your own brother's got his tongue down your girlfriend's throat. It really makes you angry. Now he's fourteen. Boarding school, being beaten for talking during lunch. And all he said was, pass the salt. It makes him so angry. Still in boarding school, in the dormitory, and he's being beaten again, this time for snoring. Snoring in a dormitory is a beating offence? Snoring with malicious intent? And the thick rubber running shoe slams against his thin cotton pyjamas. And how is that fair? And he's so frustrated and impotent and... Angry. He's got an exam in the morning. He's thirty years old and he's got an exam in the morning. All his life he's always seemed to have an exam in the morning. And those bastards in room 1115 are having a smegging party. And how many times does he have to tell them he has an exam in the morning? And every time he tells them, what do they do? They turn the music up. And another letter. Overlooked for promotion. For the sixth year on the run. Overlooked for promotion. Have to wait yet another year. And it's just not fair. It makes you so furious. The countless frustrations of a lifetime welled up inside him until he felt he would burst. Then he did. Anger dragged a primal scream from his throat. No! And fifty-three decks above, in the hologram simulation suite, the polymorph devoured his anger. Rimmer collapsed onto the moving walkway, panting, empty, and drained of all his rage. Lister paced up and down the medical unit, swinging a baseball bat, his lip curled in a deranged snarl. He smashed the bat into a lab bench between Crichton and the cat. It's war! Rimmer shook his head and recrossed his legs. Look, people, he said with an even calmness. Just because it's an armor-plated mutant killing machine that salivates unspeakable slobber, that doesn't mean it's a bad person. He bit on the end of his pipe, which he'd requested from his hologrammatic accessory computer, along with a T-shirt printed with the words, Give Keish a Chance. What we've got to do, he continued serenely, is get it round a table and put together a solution package, perhaps over tea and biscuits. Look at him. Crichton slid down from the lab bench. We can't trust his opinion. He has no anger. He's a total dork. Good point, Crichton, Rimmer said kindly. Let's take that on board, shall we? He turned to Lister and smiled. David, do you have any suggestions you'd like to bring to this forum? Yes, I have actually, Arnold, Lister mimicked. Why don't we go down to the ammunition store, get a nuclear warhead, and then strap it onto my head? I'll nut the smegger to oblivion. To emphasize his point, the sixty-one-year-old man butted a metal panel on the wall, leaving a large indentation. Right, well, that, um, that's very nice, David, Rimmer mumbled genially. But let's put that one on the back burner for a while, shall we? Cat, do you have a contribution? The cat looked up from a waste bin he was scavenging through for food. Don't ask my opinion. I'm nobody. Just pretend I'm not here. He glugged noisily from a bottle of meths he'd found on one of the shelves and belched loudly. Rimmer nodded benignly. That's lovely. 
Thank you very much. You guys are all insane. The toaster chirped from its vantage point at the back of the room. You're all emotional retards. This is a problem that calls for the leadership abilities of your old buddy, talky toaster, Peyton applied for. There was an awkward pause. Well, said Rimmer finally, moving on a step, and I hope no one thinks that I'm setting myself up as some sort of self-elected chairperson. Just see me as a facilitator. Crichton, what's your view? Don't be shy. Well, I think we should send Lister in as a decoy, and while it's busy eating him alive, we can creep up on it from behind and blast it into the stratosphere. Good plan. Lister punched the wall, breaking three of his fingers. That's the best plan yet. Let it get knackered out eating me to death, then you guys can catch it unawares. Well, that's certainly an option, David, yes. Rimmer sucked his pipe ferociously. But here's my proposal. Let's get tough. The time for talking is over. Call it extreme if you like, but I propose we hit it hard, and we hit it fast with a major, and I mean major, he leaned forward, leaflet campaign. And while it's reeling from that, we follow up with a whisk drive, a car boot sale, some street theatre, and possibly even some benefit concerts. Rimmer leaned back again. It was a radical course of action, and he just hoped he hadn't gone too far. He took a comforting suck from his hologrammatic pipe and carried on outlining his solution. Now, if that's not enough, he said almost crossly, I'm sorry, it's time for the T-shirts. Mutants out. Chameleonic life forms, no thanks. And if that doesn't get our message across, I don't know what will. Crichton rolled his eyes a full circle. Has anyone ever told you, Rimmer, that you are a disgusting, pus-filled boo-boo who has all the wit, charm, and self-possession of Jane Mansfield after the car accident? The toaster winced. Listen to me. You can't operate without fear, anger, guilt, and vanity. They're all vital emotions that protect your personalities and keep you sane. Crichton nodded and walked over to the toaster. He picked it up, jammed it into the waste disposal unit, and turned on the grinder. There was a horrible sound of mashing metals. Crichton flicked the unit off, hauled out the flattened mess of components, and tossed them in the bin. He's had that coming for a long time he said, and stamped his foot into the bin. Goodness me, said Rimmer. Surely there was a non-violent solution to your differences with the toaster. Why on earth didn't you try relationship counselling? Lister clubbed himself on the forehead with his baseball bat. Listen, you bunch of tarts. It's clobbering time. There's a body bag out there with that scudball's name on it, and I'm doing up the zip. Anyone who gets in my way gets a napalm enemy. The cat looked up from his bin. I think everybody's right, except me, so just forget I spoke, huh? Rimmer got to his feet. Um, I think we're all beginning to lose sight of the real issue here, which is what are we going to call ourselves? He paused for suggestions. None came. I think it comes down to a choice between the League Against Salivating Monsters, or my own personal preference, which is the Committee for the Liberation and Integration of Terrifying Organisms and their Rehabilitation into Society. He chewed his lip. Just one drawback with that. The abbreviation is clitoris. It needs killing. Lister started rubbing some burnt cork over his face. If that means I have to sacrifice my life in some stupid, pointless way, then all the better... Crichton nodded. Yes, why not? Even if it doesn't work, it'll still be a laugh. Right, so let's cut all of this business. Lister mimed a yakking mouth with his hand. And get on with it. Last one alive's a wet punce, he growled. Who's with me? Rimmer followed him to the hatchway. Well, the scutters won't have the protest posters ready till Thursday, but sometimes I suppose one just has to act spontaneously. Okay, people, let's go. Hey, I'm coming too. The cat staggered behind them. Maybe I can bum some money off it. Crichton took up the tail. Maybe if he handed the others over as hostages, the beast would let him go. 
he hoisted his bazookoid to waist level and held the others in his field of fire. Move it, suckers! It wasn't nearly as difficult as they expected, tracking down the polymorph. It had dined in rapid succession on a variety of emotions far richer than it was used to, and they found it lying bloated and half asleep back down in the cargo bay. It would have been easy to kill it then as it lay almost shapeless, a pulsating grey-green mush, but they couldn't agree on tactics. The cat wanted to throw itself on the creature's mercy. Lister wanted to strangle the mutant to death as soon as anyone could locate its neck. Rimmer suggested they might offer it a number of concessions, including mutant crash facilities, a chameleonic life-form helpline, and free travel passes for all slime beasts. While Crichton refused to join in the discussion and simply walked up and down one of the wide cargo aisles, happily and noisily evacuating his waste fumes, a practice mechanoids normally perform in private. As they stood over the slumbering polymorph, consumed by their pointless bickering, gradually the beast lumbered to awareness. Its primitive brain screamed for survival, and it was forced into a change. It scoured their minds for a shape to protect itself, a form that would be invulnerable while it regained its energy. And it found one. Before their eyes, the mound of blubber turned in on itself and rose up into the air, looming above their heads. The polymorph turned into a tall, green, wrought-iron lamppost. Now what do we do? Lister nutted the post. How'd you fight a lamppost? Hey! Rimmer held up a conciliatory hand. Just because it's a lamppost doesn't mean it hasn't got feelings. Isn't that right, big fella? He said to the lamppost. Crichton tried ripping off a volley of fire from his bazookoid. When the smoke finally cleared, the lamppost was scorched and a little blackened, but otherwise perfectly intact. Now what? We just have to wait, Lister snarled, until it turns into something we can kill. So they waited. Two hours passed. Two hours while the polymorph regained its strength, regained its energy. To hell with this, said Crichton finally. I'm going to loot the shops in the ship's shopping mall. But as he made to leave, there was a sickening squelching noise, and the lamppost began turning in on itself. So how did he die? The three surviving crew members would ask themselves the same questions over and over again during the weeks that followed. Whose fault was it? Was there anything anyone could have done? And the truth was, they would never know for sure. He was dead, and that was the cold, hard fact. There was no going back. Now, they were three. Lister charged the metamorphosing mass, trying to obliterate the beast before it completed its change. A tentacle whipped out of the blubber and tossed him effortlessly down the aisle. He smashed into a pile of crates and lay unconscious in the timber rubble. The other three fled down the corridor of packing cases, Crichton using the uncomplaining cat as a shield. The creature rose, shrieking to become the mucus-pulsing demonic beast of Lister's fear. The cat caught hold of Lister's collar, and Crichton dragged the two of them down the aisle. Crichton thumped down the bar on the emergency door with his hip, and they all fell backwards through it and began tumbling down a metal spiral staircase. They rolled out onto a white tiled floor and found themselves in the pump room of the air conditioning complex on the engineering deck. Rimmer scampered down the staircase behind them, his eyes alight with fear. They dragged themselves to their feet, and Crichton scoured the room for an exit. There were no doors or hatches. They were at the very bottom of the ship. Suddenly, iron girders and metal tiles began to rain down from the ceiling, and with a splintering of steel, the polymorph dropped into the pump room. Its black lips rolled back, exposing its glistening teeth, and it roared in demonic triumph. Untempered by guilt, Crichton's heightened instinct for self-preservation overrode his fear. It didn't make sense. There had to be another way out. 
There was no room on the ship that had only one exit. There had to be a second door or an airlock or something. He scanned the room again. Against the back wall was a disused pump unit lying on its side. Crichton edged back towards it and dragged it away from the wall. Behind it was an old service lift. He jabbed the call button and heard the crashing of the gears as the motor ground into action and the lift car began its creaking descent from perhaps twenty floors above. A tentacle whiplashed out and coiled around Crichton's neck, hoisting him into the air as the lift juddered to a halt and the doors sushed open. Two blue shimmering balls hovered around the lift car. They spun end over end in tiny, menacing circles before they shot out into the pump room. They streaked round the chamber before their tracking computers locked on to the hottest object in the room and screeched down towards the target. The polymorph simply disappeared. The short silence that followed the blast was broken by the sickening splatter of mucal debris and smouldering fragments of endoskeleton as the dead mutant's remains obeyed Newton. Suddenly a swirling wind whipped all the papers in the pump room into a spiralling tornado. Then the wind divided into four frenzied twisters and blasted into each of the crew. They each staggered back, filled by an energy and a force they had never experienced before. When Crichton groped his way upright, he was whole again. His guilt had returned. Oh, how can you ever forgive me? He moaned wretchedly. Naturally, I'll commit suicide immediately. He placed the muzzle of the bazookoid into his lipless mouth. The cat batted it away. Chill it, buddy, he said. We all did things back there we weren't proud of. Look at me. He stood there in his ragged, stinking clothes, his hair matted and mangled. If I don't get to a bath in the next thirty seconds, I'm going to have to resign my post as most handsome guy in this ship. The toaster, Crichton bleated. What did I do to the toaster? Lister? Rimmer crouched over Lister's immobile form. Lister? He called again. Crichton hurried over and knelt by his side. He looked down at Lister's grey face. Is he okay? He's had a heart attack. Crichton gently rolled Lister's head to one side and felt the side of his neck for a pulse. Is he okay? Rimmer said again. Crichton reached forward and his open palm closed Lister's eyes. The funeral of the last remaining member of the human race was neither a solemn nor a sombre affair. Quite the opposite. Lister's favourite dance track, Born to Brutalize, thumped out of his old wax blaster with such force it shook the coffin. Crichton, Rimmer and the cat stood around the metal casket, wearing green day-glow dealy boppers, battery-propelled revolving bow ties and yellow fishing waders, precisely as Lister had requested in his last will and testament. Rimmer had been present that drunken night Lister had decided to make a will. He'd scrawled his last wishes on a pair of his old boxers in red, indelible ink, and Rimmer ensured they followed the instructions to the last misspelt letter. The cat gently placed a sealed foil tray of chicken vindaloo by Lister's feet, followed by two spicy poppadoms and an onion salad. Crichton shuffled along behind him and placed three six-packs of leopard lager in the coffin, together with Lister's one and only photograph of Christine Kachansky. As Born to Brutalize reached its climactic nuclear guitar solo, they sealed the casket lid and fired the coffin off into space. Bye, man, said Rimmer quietly, and the three of them turned and shuffled sadly out of the waste disposal bay. Crichton busied himself setting the table for the wake. None of them felt much like drinking, but Lister had insisted they each consume an entire bottle of Cinzano Bianco. The menu was even more daunting, a triple fried egg sandwich with chili sauce and chutney, Lister's favourite snack. I suppose someone should tell Holly, said Rimmer. The cat nodded. Rimmer slouched off to the drive room. On, said Rimmer and Holly's pixelized face materialized onto the screen. Sorry to bother you, Hull, but uh, we've got some bad news. He gazed down at the floor. It's Lister, he said eventually. He's dead. Holly nodded. 
I thought you'd want to know. Yes. Holly paused for two of his valuable remaining seconds. How? Heart attack. Rimmer sketched in the details. Holly listened, and when Rimmer had finished, he simply said, Oh, and switched himself off. Rimmer had passed under the drive room exit hatch and was halfway down the corridor before the noise started. Printers printing. He wheeled round and walked back into the drive room. Every single printer was churning out ream after ream of calculations and instructions. Rimmer stood in the hatchway and his face yielded to a grin, which in turn gave way to laughter. Not his normal, hollow, braying, empty laughter. This was an altogether different noise. This was a noise his vocal cords had never been called on to make before. It was the laughter of joy. Crichton and the cat were in the sleeping quarters, sifting through a stack of old photographs when Rimmer poked his red face through the hatchway and said breathlessly, Quick! Come on! Then vanished. By the time the cat had sauntered over to the hatchway, Rimmer was two hundred and fifty yards down the corridor and still accelerating. They started after him. Rimmer bounded down the emergency staircase four steps at a time and carried on down the ship without a break for thirty-two floors. He was moving so fast that several times even the cat thought he'd lost him. Finally, Rimmer emerged on the shuttle deck and streaked across the lined runway towards White Giant. By the time Crichton and the cat hit the shuttle bay, Rimmer was high-stepping up the ship's embarkation ramp. He disappeared inside. Seconds later, the retros blasted into the ground, and the cat and Crichton had to complete the last part of the journey through blinding, billowing white smoke. They leapt onto the hovering embarkation ramp and ran along its length as it began to retract into the craft. They stumbled inside, coughing and tear-blind, as the hatch slammed closed. They staggered towards the cockpit over scutters sorting through reams of computer printout as the transport craft's autopilot taxied it down the runway and out into space. They listed into the cockpit section where Rimmer stood impatiently jiggling his right leg and flopped into the two drive seats. What's happening, buddy? Where are we going? Rimmer's left arm snaked out and pointed through the cockpit's viewscreen at a glimmering brown dot in the distance. Follow that coffin! The cat flipped the controls to manual and pressed the reheat button. White Giant burned across the blackness in pursuit of the slow spinning casket. Nothing. At first, there was nothing. Then, then there was something. It was a light, a tiny shard of brilliance that shocked him with its suddenness. Then, then there was nothing again. There was no way of telling how long it lasted. Nothing has no time. Then the light again. And the light grew. And across the face of the light, dark shapes began to move. He watched as the shapes became faces, faces he didn't know. They were concerned faces, gentle, kindly. They made him feel safe. Then he lost consciousness. But unconsciousness wasn't like nothing. It was studded with dreams. He dreamed of a garden pungent with jasmine. He knew the garden. He knew it very well. But he had no idea where or when he knew it from. Then pain. Something imploded in his chest. He lurched upright, and there was a second implosion, and the pain was gone. He drifted back off to sleep. When he awoke, it was dusk. He was in a bed with clean white cotton sheets tightly tucked into the sides. There was a green screen around the bed, so the rest of the room was obscured from him. By the bedside, on a cabinet, there was a huge vase full of jasmine, with some kind of greeting card nestling among the yellow flowers. His left arm, for some reason, felt weak and helpless, so he reached up with his right and plucked the card from its place. In the half-light, his old eyes couldn't focus on the inscription. He replaced the card and overcome with weariness, slid back into sleep. When he woke again, he was moving. Fluorescent lights streaked past above him. He tried to raise his head, but a friendly hand patted it down again as the hospital trolley raced along the white-tiled corridor. They burst through three sets of overlapping rubber doors, and suddenly they were outside in the biting wind of the cold winter air. There was a jerk, and the stretcher was hoisted off the trolley. 
There was a commotion, people were shouting things he didn't understand, and all the time the pain in his chest was getting worse. Two men ran with his stretcher and slid him into the back of a waiting ambulance. The doors slammed closed, and the ambulance screeched off. Where am I? An oxygen mask loomed over him, and once again he blacked out. He came to as the ambulance doors swung open, and the same two men hauled his stretcher out of the vehicle and set it down on a pavement in the middle of a circle of people. What's happening? he bleated pathetically. Gingerly, the two men eased him off the stretcher and placed him on the cold, hard pavement. One of them packed up the stretcher and dashed back with it to the ambulance, while the other twisted his leg so it folded under his body, then lifted up his head and slid his arm underneath it. The pain was unbearable now. He tilted his head weakly and watched as the two men jumped into the ambulance and reversed off into the busy traffic. He lay on his back, peripherally aware of the circle of onlookers. One of them, a woman, was talking, but she sounded vague and distant, and he couldn't make it out. One by one, the onlookers began to drift away, until eventually he was totally alone, lying in his unnatural pose on the pavement. The pain reached a crescendo and imploded in his chest. He jumped to his feet, staggered along a shop window, regained his balance, and started to walk slowly down the street. The worst of the pain had subsided. Just a sharp ache in his left arm remained, and his breathing was beginning to come more easily. Half dazed, he shuffled along the street, found a bench, and sat down. After ten minutes, he didn't feel too badly at all, and decided to go for a coffee. He found a cafe just a few shops down, and sat at one of the red plastic tables. Almost immediately, a waitress came over and set down a plate of money. Then she smiled at him pleasantly and scurried off. Soon after, she returned with some crockery, a cup, a saucer, and a plate. She put them on his table and went off to serve someone else. The cup was dirty. It had a coffee ring around the top, and there was some half dissolved sugar in the bottom. The plate was dirty too. It was covered in crumbs, and in the middle there was a huge blob of mayonnaise. He held up his hand to call back the waitress, but suddenly he realized he was going to be sick. Liquid gushed up his throat, but he managed to catch it in the coffee cup. But he hadn't been sick. He looked into the cup. It was half full of coffee. Then he was filled with panic again. This time he definitely was going to be sick. He reached up to his mouth and regurgitated a perfectly shaped triangular tuna and mayonnaise sandwich. Three other quarters followed in fast succession, along with a sliver of cucumber, a slice of tomato, and a small portion of watercress. Help, he said quietly. His throat gurgled again, and he filled the coffee cup to the top. He smelt the cup. It was coffee. Fresh. Steam was coming off it. He dipped his teaspoon in and swirled it around. When he brought the spoon out again, it was full of sugar. He tipped it into the sugar bowl and looked around the cafe. A large woman with two unruly children was midway through regurgitating an enormous chocolate eclair. On the next table, a man was jabbing a fork into his mouth and pulling out French fries. He looked over to the waitress and watched as she flipped open the pedal bin, took out a handful of rib bones, and arranged them on a large white plate. Then she served the bones to two teenage boys sitting at the counter. He watched as the boys raised the bones to their mouths and began to fill them with meat. The waitress swept over to his table and took away his sandwich and his coffee. She held the cup under a cappuccino machine, which sucked the liquid noisily up into its metal cylinder. Then she opened the sandwich, spooned the tuna and mayonnaise filling into a bowl, effortlessly scraped the bread clean of butter, and returned the bread to a large uncut loaf. He left the cafe. Deciding he needed some fresh air. All the traffic was going backwards. What was this place? What was he doing here? Almost every aspect of the city was strange and unfamiliar. He tramped around for twenty minutes, looking for a landmark, something he might recognize, but it was hopeless. When he next looked around, he found he'd wandered off the main street and was in a dimly lit alley. He felt panicked and alone. Suddenly, he heard urgent footsteps coming towards him from behind. Before he could turn, the man was on him, pressing him up against a wall and holding a short silver knife against his throat. 
Deftly, the mugger fastened a watch around the old man's wrist, then slipped a wallet into the inside pocket of the old man's coat. He watched, bemused as the mugger flipped closed the blade of his knife, smiled with false charm, and raced off down the alley. Help, the old man said quietly. What's happening to me? He opened the wallet and looked inside. Astonishingly, his own photograph was in one of the credit card compartments. There was a driving license too. The name on the license was Retzil Divad. It took the old man a good ten minutes to realize the name was his, because, like everything else in this crazy place, his name was backwards. Four thousand dull gunmetal grey canisters lay stacked in neat ranks in the scoop room of White Giant's cargo section. Here's some more," said Crichton as a fresh haul of canisters clattered down the chute. He read the numbers and then one by one tossed them to the cat, who began to pile them alongside the others. "Has anyone even the vaguest, remotest idea what it is we're doing here?" asked Rimmer. The cat and Crichton grunted verbal shrugs. The truth was, none of them even pretended to begin to understand the list of instructions, data, formulae, and coordinates Holly had left them. Not even the newly repaired toaster claimed to understand this one. Although it was fair to say it wasn't in tip-top peak condition, despite the many hours Crichton had spent panel beating its chrome cover and reconstructing its mashed circuitry. Crichton wasn't exactly an expert when it came to artificial intelligence, and the toaster wasn't all it might be in the sanity department. In fact, for some reason, the toaster now thought it was a moose. It bellowed loudly from time to time, and occasionally threatened to charge them with its huge antlers. But otherwise, it was harmless. More canisters scuttled down the chute, and once again, Crichton studied the numbers. Got it! He squealed with delight and clapped his hands. The cat began rotating his body from side to side and pumping his hands so they circled over each other in front of his chest. Yes, yes, yes! Excellente! Grinned Rimmer. Mahu! Bellowed the toaster. It had been easy enough collecting Lister's coffin and returning it to a stasis booth on Red Dwarf, but the second instruction was a little more bizarre. They had to locate a swarm of canisters floating through space at a certain set of coordinates and bring aboard the one numbered one one two one. Holly had failed to mention there would be something in the region of ten thousand of these canisters, and the search had taken them the best part of five weeks. What next? Asked Rimmer as he craned over Crichton's shoulder, trying to read the indecipherable machine code. I'm supposed to treat the canister, bombard it with X-rays, gamma rays, all kinds of stuff. Then what? Crichton consulted Holly's sheet again. We take Lister's body on a little trip. Where? Through the black hole, into the Omni Zone, to a particular planet in Universe Three. Apparently, we're to bury him there. Universe Three. What's so special about Universe Three? Well, apart from the fact that it's almost a mirror image of our own universe, except that time moves backwards there, Crichton said, there's nothing very special about it at all. The cat shook the canister. What's this got to do with anything? What's in it? I don't know. Crichton flipped through the instructions. Maybe some chemical we have to use later. I don't think so. Rimmer tried to suffocate a smirk. I've got a pretty good idea what is in there, and I don't think you'll find it's a chemical. He raised an enigmatic eyebrow and walked back to the cockpit, whistling happily. So time was running backwards. It had taken Lister a while to figure it out, but if he reversed the events of the day, it all seemed to come together. He'd walked down a dark alley where a mugger had stolen his watch and his wallet. In a daze, he'd stumbled through the streets until he came across a cafe where he'd had a coffee and something to eat to calm his nerves. Obviously, it hadn't worked because he'd gone out into the street, suffered a heart attack, and been rushed to hospital. After a few hours slipping in and out of consciousness, he'd suffered a second heart attack and died. Except, of course, it had all happened backwards. He looked at the address on his driving license. A cab screeched up backwards beside him. He leaned in the window, 
accepted the fare and the tip from the cabbie, and climbed in. Lister was about to attempt to read out the backwards address on his license when the cab pulled off and began reversing through the streets at high speed. The driver knew where he was going, which, when Lister thought about it, made some kind of sense. If everything was backwards, presumably, when they reached their destination, Lister would have to tell the driver where he picked him up. His brain ached. Suddenly, the cab stopped, caught up in traffic. Lister leant out of the window to see what was causing the jam. Three fire engines pulled up outside a ruined building. As the firemen uncoiled their hoses, the ruins began to smolder. The hoses sucked giant jets of water out of the smoking rubble, and within minutes the ruins were a flaming orange inferno. When the blaze had reached its peak, the firemen put away their hoses and drove off with sirens blaring. The traffic began to shuffle past the fire. By the time Lister's cab had passed it, the fire was almost out. Where the ruins had been, there now stood a chic new office block. Lister shook his head and ducked back into the cab. There was a newspaper jammed down the side of the bench seat. He dug it out and opened it out to the front page. Under the headline was a large photo of the blaze he'd just witnessed. This wasn't helping his brain ache. Finally, he realized it must be an old newspaper from the previous morning. In the backwards reality, obviously, news was reported before it happened. A thought struck him, and he turned to the Sir Autobo column, and there he was, Retzel Divad. It took him a while to translate the accompanying text: David Lister, age sixty-one, joyfully brought to life on Thursday, the twenty-first, at eleven thirty p.m. See personal column. Lister feverishly ripped through the pages and found the personal column. He traced his finger down the entries and stopped when he found one that was printed forwards. Dave Lister, it said. Sure, everything will become clear to you. This was the only way. Obviously, can't be with you. Everyone would get younger. We'll pick you up in thirty-six years. Be at Niagara Falls by the souvenir shop at noon precisely. See you then. Good luck from the Red Dwarf crew. They'd done it again. They'd marooned him in some insane part of the universe, expecting him to cope alone for the best part of forty years. To do that once was bad enough. To do it twice, twice in consecutive lifetimes, that was sheer bad manners. Lister was a social animal. He hated being alone. Always had done. He looked out of the cab window. It was beginning to rain. There should have been a saxophone playing a wistful, melancholy blues number. The rain swirled up from the wet pavements and hurled itself into the scowling clouds above. Finally, the cab screeched to a start outside the address on the driving license. He was home, whatever that meant. The taxi door flung itself open, and Lister climbed out. He took the key from his wallet, walked up the path to the house, and let himself in. It was a big house. Whatever he was destined to do for a living, it looked like he was destined to do it pretty successfully. He walked into the first reception room. Framed photographs jostled for position on the old stone mantelpiece. This was his life, the life he was about to lead in this strange reality in which he was an interloper. Something in one of the photographs caught his eye, and he scrutinized the others more closely. Impossible! It just wasn't possible, not even with an IQ of twelve thousand. But the evidence was there in the photographs. Somehow Holly had done it. But how? Lister would have to wait thirty-six years to find out the answer. He turned and watched the lace curtains fluttering in the breeze through the open French windows. He crossed the room and stepped out into the garden. At the end of the lawn, an old woman in a wide-brimmed sun hat was clipping away at the jasmine borders. She looked up and saw him, and her face crinkled into a famous pinball smile. Thirty-six years, they would grow young together. They had a whole new past to look forward to. The old man's face crinkled into a smile of its own, and he started shuffling down the garden towards her.